talk about fighting in fantasy stories, which is like my absolute favorite topic ever. We should so. have the chairs all around the outside then. I know, yeah, <laughs> right. Well, it's not going to be demonstrations, but it will be blood. <laughs> so um, I'm going to just let, I'll introduce myself and I'll let everybody introduce themselves. Um, you should be no ladies first, I guess, or something. Well, you're the moderator. Basically. Yeah, I'm the moderator. Um, and I'm not a good moderator, so they'll jump in. That's okay. Um, I'm Betsy Dornbush. I write epic fantasy, um, despite the um, non-blood splattered um, character on the front of my book. Um, he spends most of his time blood splattered and trying to figure out how to like get out of those clothes and find new clothes because it's really gross. Um, and so this is the second book, Emissary. The first book is Exile. And I also edit the magazine Electric Spec. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Travis Hearman, and I'm a local writer. I've got well, my sixth novel is coming out uh, in June. Um, I write um, well. I'm in the middle of a historical fantasy series right now, uh, but I also write a lot of horror, um, a lot of adventure fantasy, uh, mystery, science fiction, kind of across the board. Hey everyone, I'm Scott Beckman. I uh, I just published this uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, so I'm, I'm really new to the whole thing, uh, but I've just recently got through kind of the whole process of getting professionally edited, going through the self-publishing process. Um, so I've learned a lot in a very short amount of time. Uh, I am a resident of Denver, been in my whole life. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, this is gonna be a series, so I'm working on the sequel to it. My name is Josh Vogt. I'm an author and freelance writer. Uh, part of my freelancing is writing for role-play game companies, so Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder and that sort of thing. I've got, my first two novels are actually both out next month. One is Pathfinder Tales, which is a sword and sorcery adventure. Uh, the main character is a dwarven barbarian who she has a bit of a temper, so she likes to get into fights a lot. And then uh, the other one is called Enter the Janitor, which is an urban <laughs> fantasy. Uh, it also involves uh, lots of fights, but they're involving mops and brooms and squeegees. So <laughs> it's, it's a bit different. Magic squeegees. Magic squeegees. <laughs> so, yeah. As long as there's fighting. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's, yeah. there's, yes. Lots of but it's clean fighting. You could do the other. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm David Boop. I'm also a local author. Um, I have one novel that's about to be re released in August called She Murdered Me with Science. It's a sci fi noir. Um, I'm predominantly known for writing weird westerns, especially a lot of paranormal crossover sort of things. Uh, so I do a lot of fantasy fighting. Uh, my two most recent uh, short stories uh, are out in Supernatural Colorado, um, which is a, a very strong fantasy uh, piece uh, where I had to learn how to fight on, on uh, the back of horses. How, how, actually, really, I had to learn how horses fight each other is kind of how I had to do that one. And then this one is a uh, uh, steampunk in space. So, uh, and there's uh, some alien life, so it's kind of, it's got kind of a sci fantasy feel to it. So. Your horseback fighting scenes weren't like Abraham Lincoln vampire. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I see, and, and the thing is, I had to, I blocked that movie, so I had to go back and I had to remember what it was that I blocked. Yeah. So thank you for that. <laughs> so I can tell you definitely no, and I hate you. <laughs> So wait, that, that wasn't historically accurate? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were vampires back then, weren't there? I thought... No, they didn't come around until... Yes. <laughs> yeah, they didn't come around until 20. Yeah, I thought he, I thought he yeah. emancipated yeah. the vampires. <laughs> <laughs> Is that not right? So, so I'm going to ask the question, because I love writing fight scenes. Um, in fact, I was just thrilled about this two nights ago on Skippy and Fanny. Um, so what... What do you love about writing fancy or fight scenes? Like, what? Why do you? Why do you even have them? Well, fight scenes were probably what got me into writing in the first place. I mean, I find I find my tastes have changed since I started this whole gig. Right? You know, um, I, I tend to write less fight scenes now than I used to. But um, I mean, that, there's just that. I mean, what 13-year-old boy just doesn't want to pick up a sword and just you know, go after the aliens, right? uh, So that's it. That's, that's it. And then lightsabers come on. <laughs> yeah, duh. Uh, for me, fight scenes, I would say sort of a love-hate relationship with fight scenes in that uh, um, 
you don't necessarily have like the subtlety that you might want to bring out in in dialogue or something like that. But right? it's not as complex necessarily. You just have action. You just got people doing things. Um, so a lot of fun there, uh, for sure. But I think that the behavior relationship, at least on my end, is uh, it's easy to overwrite. Uh, so really stripping them down so that uh, you're not walking the reader through every single swing of a sword or uh, anything like that. So I feel like they're harder every to edit. Every movement maybe. of a joint. Yeah, right? exactly. Right? Yeah. Like well, you can see it so well in your head, but it's hard to... There is an audience for that, though. There are readers who want that type of detail, but you have to be known for being that type of, you know, they have to find you, and then, yeah. then they'll love you forever. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, know, I guess I like leaving things up to their imagination a little bit more. I like fight scenes because they're fun. <laughs> um, they are dramatic. I think that they can actually do a great job of developing your character. Uh, I mean, some people use fight scenes just as filler or just for the action, but you can actually show a lot of the character's personality, uh, their perspective on life, on why they fight, how they fight, who they fight. Uh, so if you, if you look at it that way, it's not just an action scene, but it's something that can actually provide some depth to the story. So I think so they're they're a tool and a technique for storytelling. Fight scenes are imperative to any fiction and the reason being is that fiction is about conflict, uh, both internal and external. And especially when you start getting into fantasy writing or science fiction writing, that external conflict has to reflect the internal conflict. And the internal conflict in fantasy and science fiction sometimes is so much larger than, say, something you would get out of an Oprah novel. Okay, And you will still have a certain amount of external conflict in an Oprah novel, but the, the internal conflict is so much more important there. But when we look at fantasy, and we'll just, we'll go ahead and take Star Wars for an example, the internal conflict of Luke Skywalker following his father's destiny, uh, can he do it, is, is he worthy, and all of this, uh, is such a big thing because the fate of the galaxy rests on him. It's not just whether or not you know, he's, he's going to um, win his true love, uh, whether or not he's going to get a job, or anything like that. It's the fate of the galaxy. This is a huge huge internal conflict. So then the external conflict needs to also reflect that. You need space battles, you need lightsabers, you need, you know, the the um, turret scene when they're fleeing the Death Star. Because each one of those external conflicts is a is a bridging point. It's a it's a stepping stone for the internal conflict. It's building his his confidence, his credibility to be that person who is eventually going to save the galaxy. So they are absolutely imperative. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say, I really think that, um, to me, fight scenes are such an opportunity to show character and, and to show um, the world, too. Um, because if you have fight scenes, <coughs> unless you have a character who is just an aberration, typically they're in a situation, they're in a world where they have to fight their way through. And um, how they feel about that can show so much. Um, and so if you write a scene that's not reflecting all that, mm -hmm. at some point, and it may happen after, they may be mechanical during the scene, but then they catch the breath and something, you know, that sort of hits them. Um, like, like Draken's always um, trying to get the blood off him, you know? He's a very, he's a confident fighter, but he's always trying to get the blood off of him. And because he just has this sense of having blood-stained hands. So I think, you know, there's a lot of ways. So, so how do you guys do that? Like, how do you guys show that internal conflict, or even maybe a larger world conflict within like a certain fight scene? Like, how does that? How do you mechanically do that, where you sort of start to reflect uh, outward and maybe inward on your characters? On well, your characters I'm gonna, I'm gonna, world. I'm gonna, we'll just make it a really big question. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm, I'll take two sequences from um, Game of Thrones because the, they're they're very big, they're very powerful sequences, and they both involve Tywin Tywin Lannister. Yeah. Um, and uh, he um, in in one 
he he's accused of something and he, he's going to be killed, <laughs> and so he gets a champion to fight for him, and he gets like this badass mercenary <laughs> who kicks the living crap out of the opponent. All right, now what's important? Tyrion. You're talking about Tyrion. Tyrion. Sorry, I, yeah, okay. sorry, I, I knew I'd said it wrong. Tyrion. I've always thought George, those names are too close. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's what happens with father and son yeah. sometimes. But okay. Yeah. So, um, so, um, and in, in that point, what's important about the internal conflict there is it's the first time that he has had to rely on somebody other than himself to get himself out of trouble. So that's very, very important. The second time that he has somebody champion him and fight for him, that person dies, he loses. Even though he's innocent of the crime he's been accused of, his champion loses and all of a sudden he's back to where he was where it, it's, he's been spending time trusting other people now for a good two books and all of a sudden now he's on his own again and he realizes that and he is stuck um, and he can't get himself out there's nothing he can do he has, he, he has nobody left to trust at this point turns out he does have some people to trust but the both of those con in in both of those sequences the fighting was so important so it's showing the progression of the character correct yeah. so even though he wasn't the one fighting himself right so yeah that's a, that's a really interesting yeah that's a good example well thank you <laughs> do i get a star good job <laughs> <laughs> you guys have to start bringing stars I to, need to start bringing, whenever i moderate i need to like run around and give a Good job. Good job. I, hear for I used you. to be a teacher, so you know I could do that. <laughs> Does anybody else have like an example or a thought on how they how they reflect? Well, well you you yeah. mentioned like how you don't necessarily. I, when I think of fight scenes and the internal conflict versus the external, one of the pitfalls I find is that people will bog down the pacing of the fight in order to have the internal conflict or in, you know, the emotions and the thoughts come to the surface mm -hmm. more. And it always makes me think of when you're reading a graphic novel, you have that one panel where somebody's throwing a punch and they're giving a, a dialogue that's about five minutes long if you actually read it. Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, and, and so you can't obviously be talking and having this monologue while you're doing a single punch because that mm -hmm. happens in a split second. So if you do have a fight, you can have the internal side of it. Um, but have it before, have it after, or have some sort of natural lull in the middle where maybe they're circling and pacing. Don't have it like they're swinging the sword and then they go off on this big rabbit trail. It, it is a lot of the pacing of it. Uh, because when you, how many people here have been in a fight, been sparred, done martial arts, or anything like that? You know, anybody can die. You right. just read 30 books where you stopped believing anybody could, none of the principal characters could ever die. And then now we're and Now all of a sudden, and because of that, because of that, they had a character who had been through all of the books, almost from the very beginning, who had this incredible fight sequence where he's kind of like doing a Gandalf, holding the bridge to allow people to escape sort of thing. And, and it's like a three-page fight sequence where it's him alone with a lightsaber against like easily 50, 70, 100 uh, aliens are coming at him. And he's standing there and he's fighting. and I bought it, I believed it, and his death affected me um, because I now believe these characters could die. And, uh, and it wasn't a shock. I knew he was gonna die, but his death meant something to me now. I'd say that's George R. R. Martin's thing right after that. Right. Yeah. That's like why he killed Ned Stark, that's, that's right? He, he said it from the beginning. So well, yeah. Like, yeah, he wanted yeah. to die. As well. yeah, yeah, and he said he it's wanted like to break the hero's journey. Well, the first scene has a death in it, so mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, yeah. it's pretty... As you uh, raise the stakes. Scene, I guess, like, yeah. Like, all set you know, I, and this is a little off the topic, but um, I, is anybody watching Daredevil? Like, I'm in love. I'm <laughs> in love with that show. Um, and there's this incredible scene, a fight scene, and he's all beat up anyway, but he goes in anyway and fights all these guys in this hallway. And so much of the action takes takes place. If you can, it's, it may be on YouTube by now. It's such an it'll be well, an put, iconic. Did, did you put that on the webpage the other day? I mentioned it. You're talking about the, the hallway fights. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it, it's it's going to become this iconic thing because it, it is just it was it's like one of those things I have to watch it like twelve times. But 
it's funny, somebody said, well, you know, he could have just, there's a little boy at the end, which is the deal, that there's a little boy at the end of the hallway that's like captive, and so that's what he's gonna do. He's gonna like take all these people out and he's gonna rescue the little boy. And so some guy said, well, why, why didn't he just, all the doors were closed, why didn't he just walk down the hallway and get the kid? And he could have, he could have done that. But that showed so much character and showed so much story and so much of his own worldview that he actually chose to fight, that he opened the door and chose to fight. I was like, if you're not getting that, you're not, you know, you're not getting the character. Well, old like, boy, you know. old, old boy, have you ever seen the original old boy, the Hong Kong one? That has that type of fight sequence yeah, in it. Where he and, doesn't need, he doesn't yeah, have it's, to. it's definitely a my it's brilliant. It is the longest single shot and this fight was, scene. This was yeah. a single shot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, it was like six minutes long. It's, yeah. I can't yeah. even yeah. Oh, though, though I I think awesome. the Peter Griffin and the chicken fight's still longer. <laughs> but I'm not sure. Yeah. So. You had a question, Jeff. I did. Um before you guys jump into a different a different topic. Um my girlfriend and I are well, wanting to write short stories and or, you know, kind of flash fiction teaser type stories. And I was curious, can you um, can you have a fight sequence that starts out that short story or that bit of flash fiction before the readers get to know about the character? Would you rec would could you do that? Is it possible to do it convincingly or is that a no no? I, w I was just asked this actually because this book starts pretty early with a fight scene, um, a, a pretty big battle scene, um, and I was asked about that. And well, one, it's a sequel, so I felt like I could do it in that case, which is totally different than the situation you're in. Um, I think it has to be about stakes, and I think it's going to probably not revolve around your main character, but it's going to revolve around some kind of stakes or some kind of enemy that the reader can instantly grasp onto and identify with, well, yes, I would that I would fight that too, you know? Um, I would step in and fight that too. It's it's tough though. That's a tough thing to it, do. It, yeah, you, gotta, you have to be careful. Uh, yeah. I think a successful example is Firefly. Uh, the very first episode of the pilot opens yeah. with a battle scene. Yeah. But in the course of that battle scene, we see who to root for. Right. We all of a sudden, we know by the end of that battle scene, we know exactly who Mal is. We know exactly who Zoe is. Um, so I think that was that's an example that was done really well. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to disagree a little bit. In um, Sarah Hoyt uh, told me once that you never open up uh, a, a short story on somebody's pain, is how she said it. So imagine if you would opening up a door and there's somebody just crying at your door, somebody you've never met before. Okay. What does that feel like to you? How do you how do you react to that? You know, it's like some people are going to be very sympathetic. It's like, oh, you know, what's wrong? And some people are going to be freaked out because there's somebody there just bawling on your doorstep. Well, see, I disagree with that because I mean, this is that every rule can be broken, right? right? So again, I think it gets down to well, what are they crying about? If you know very quickly. I mean, within probably in flash fiction, you'd have to know within mm -hmm. a couple sentences, right. um, or maybe even the first sentence if you can structure it that way. If you can understand what has them so upset or has them fighting, then I think it can, you know, it can work. I, I think I but think you have to be very careful. See, and I'm talking about the actual. Careful. Yeah, I'm talking about the actual action. Like, if we're right. talking about fight scenes, we're talking about action sequences. Right. Okay. So, well, flash so fiction, every sentence has to have character and it, has to have. It, it's I mean, got to do five to, things. Yeah, it has yeah. to do so, so you have to be, character and world and, and yeah. conflict in every sentence. Basically. So you have to be careful if that first scene is something that does is a, is an action that doesn't carry, you know, some sort of explanation with it. And uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I just I just actually wrote a flash fiction piece that starts about one minute after somebody uh, was almost hung. You know, they were basically, the, 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 somebody was trying to hang. It's, an, it's a Western piece, and it's an unsuccessful hanging. And it starts with them getting up after the attempted hanging, not with the attempted hanging, okay? Because if I had done that, 
with the whole struggling and then the guns going off and the shooting the horse. That's how they got out of it. They shot the horse underneath them. The that horse collapsed. So mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you're not supposed to kill animals. <laughs> I, that is a rule. I, 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 have, I have killed so many animals. <laughs> you would not like my story. First rule of medieval war is go for the horse. Yeah, you know, yeah. 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 you, know, you kill the dog, you're going to get sympathy. So, you know, that's why they killed Chewbacca. Um, but, the, but anyway, so I started not with the, uh, the act of the attempted hanging, but the effects of the after. And it's, I feel it's a stronger story for it. So to answer your question, Chance, <laughs> um, you're right. Uh, yeah. You're gonna have to be careful. Be careful. Very careful. Uh, yeah. Min I would um, say for something like a short story or flash fiction, especially, minimize the actual action you show. Yeah. Show the impact of it. If you can summarize, I mean, fights can be summarized to a line or two. Yeah. If you really, you know, he he wiped them out. Fight. You know, yeah. that was a fight. No line. You know. Um, he laid, you know, he, he laid into them, and they all, and you know, five seconds later, they were all down. That was a fight, scene. you know, that sort of thing. So you can put that in there, but when you are trying for an economy of words, you know. yeah. When I, yeah, because I'm, we're we're talking like maybe a three or four page story, uh -huh. right. that kind of thing. But but interesting. Okay. I think, yeah, I think write all... it out and then start trimming, and yeah. and I think that's true of a lot of short stories. Yeah. Now we're totally digressing. Um, but I think it's true of a lot of short stories that you you know you write your short story and then you then you go back and you go oh here's where it's supposed to start but here's here's what it's supposed to do even if you plot like I do a long incessant plotter but I still do that yeah you know so you you might like on draft just give yourself permission to write it all out and then and then you know come back and start really cutting. And there's an important thing that that Betsy's saying there is basically. You have to master the rules before you can break them. The type of thing you're talking about is, is a dangerous line. Yeah. So write it out, you know, in, in you know, practice it. Get <coughs> write it out like it was a normal thing and <laughs> then scene, see like see where your cut is and that's going to improve your skill. Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, bring them on, bro. Yeah. yeah. Well I am just sort of wondering because you brought up the fact that in real time fight, it happens very quickly and stuff like that. I'm wondering for, I guess, more of a strategist sort of character, I mean, you know, do you, do you ever take time to, like, have them, like, plan out things ahead of time, like, study their opponent, like, know what conflicts they're going sure. into beforehand, and, like, does that affect things, like, you know, so that it was no challenge, or do surprises still well, come out? The, the, th the thing to remember is that, uh, no battle plan ever survives contact with the enemy. <laughs> um, that's a that's sort of an old military adage. Um, no matter how much you plan, it will not survive the first contact uh, during a fight uh, because things happen that are that will be outside of your plan. And they every and they have, time. And, the, and, the, and guess what? The enemy has a plan too, and yeah. it might be better than your plan. Yeah. And in fiction, it probably unless it's that the very last fight in the book, it probably ought to, their plan ought to be better. Yeah, you know? um, there, there better be a way to, to upend your, your, you know, your main character. Um, I, I, I mean, I do that. I spend some time strategizing. I haven't let my characters strategize. What I, my tricks are I don't, I don't put everything on the page. Um, and I try and put a little conflict around that. So either the characters are conflicting over what's the best course to take, um, and maybe the main character chooses a course and forces it through and it's wrong. Um, but you, you have to, yeah, you've got to upend them somehow. There's a, there, you can do a stylistic trick as well. Um, how many of you have seen the, Sher the, the Sherlock Holmes movies, the new ones? Mm -hmm. So you have those bits where you obviously, he's about to go into a fight scene and you have this visual shift to where he rejects all the moves that are going to happen, accurate or not, right. and then we snap back to that instant that obviously was a thought that just went through his head. You can do that on the page as well. Um, I have seen, I've read books, and I, I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head, but I've read them where the character will have like, it will be an obvious break from, he'll start to move, you'll have this sequence of, this is gonna happen, and these guys are over here, and he kind of analyzes, almost like a Jason Bourne, scenario where he you know this is his instinct he just analyzes automatically 
but the, the writer slows it down for you so that you can see how he thinks and how he analyzes it and prepares for it in an instant. Have you ever seen that handled in a different way? Uh, you mean as far as like somebody like real well, time? Real time, yeah. I mean, you have characters who will do you know battle plans before going into war and all that kind of stuff. You can do that for sure. But again, whether that stands up to reality or not. That's well, it. you do have to remember it is again it's fiction, so right. you have to you have to sure. throw a wrench in the works. Yeah. Otherwise, if you have a character that you know makes a plan and follows through and everything goes and it goes fine, flawlessly, <laughs> then there's no real story. Yeah. So. But I don't think it's bad to plan and bad to you know let let that unfold on the. What it does is it gives um it gives the the reader a chance to see, especially if you're looking at some kind of battle, you know, real large scale battle. It gives them a chance to, to lay it out in their mind where things where things are, what's going to happen, and that can be really important to get those you know get those logistics sort of laid out, even if you're going to you know have it go south. Um, it gives them some foundation. So I would say you rush in, you can. I would say too. I would get worried about that. Be, like if you have a, a main character and that's his main fighting style, he's really strategic, and he's going to think through that every time. That can get really rote. I think really quickly. Like I can be, the readers are going to expect that now. And if he's always successful, then exactly, it's not very interesting. Right. So uh, the Sherlock Holmes movies are actually a great example where you know in the first fight scene that that's how Sherlock Holmes thinks, right? Because they establish that for you. And then there's later ones where you don't know what he's thinking. You just see crazy shit happening, <laughs> right? You're like, what the hell is going on here? And it's by the end you realize, oh, it's because he had all that planned out. Like he had that in his head. So it kind of opens the door to make fight scenes really interesting, maybe? That's a good point. Like, you can establish that they are actually planning, but you don't actually have to show it on the page later. Right. Yeah. If you show it every time, then you're kind of missing a chance to, to be more creative with it. And yeah. it can, I can get more, you know, just not as interesting for a reader. Harry it's Potter really books. fun to get a cocky character, you know, get yeah. some character cocky. Yeah. Like, yeah. they've had a couple successes on that, you know, pull the rug out. All right, and that's exactly like the end of the second Sherlock Holmes movie, a total spoiler. But like when he it goes through his thought process and then it doesn't work. And it's the first time it didn't work because he's met a, an opponent that he can't that he can't count on to, to beat. Um, so exactly, it sets you up really well for really interesting character development if you're if you know how to use it. I'd also say um, look in that example. Look at the uh, Harry Potter books, especially some of the earlier wizard duels where it really goes into Harry's thought process. Um, with you know when he's when he's practicing against Malfoy and so forth, you kind of get the idea of what's the what's the process of you know the battle. What when somebody throws something, what are you throwing against it and so forth. Um, then later on in the books, we don't need we don't need that thought process anymore. You know we we've established that when you throw this this kind of curse, then you throw this kind of defense. But in the beginning they're having to dig that knowledge out. They're, they're having to pull that from some place that they've never had to pull before, but it becomes reflex later. Um, one I was going to recommend, and, and Josh could probably back me up on this, is Patrick Rothfuss. Have you read any of his? So his character, Cloth, uh, learns a lot of different types of fighting styles over the course of the novels, and some of them are incredibly detailed and involve a lot of strategy going into to learning the fighting uh, style but then when he later on when he's actually using it um, he doesn't he doesn't spend as much time explaining the thought process and the strategy behind it we know that because it was established during the training sequences and so forth when, when does he start actually fighting in that book because I got halfway through the <laughs> <laughs> Um, about halfway through the second book, okay. so which is about I five missed, normal yeah. books. Okay. Uh, I, I missed, <laughs> this is like five thousand pages. Yeah, yeah. It's really yeah. I think I'm the only person on the planet that really. I was like, yeah, and I like. He's well, a nice guy. I, love, I like. The, the, the thing, thing I like, like about yeah. Rothfuss is is about every I don't know so many hundred pages. It's like a new book. <laughs> so you know, it starts off kind of a. Uh, Dickensian Oliver Twist sort of thing. Then it goes into a Harry Potter sort of thing. Then with Game of Thrones. I mean, you know, we keep going. So, so yeah. So you know, just about the time I would get bored. It's a new book. So. <laughs>
Yep. Um, so how do you guys feel about like a completely made up fighting style? Like how detailed does it have to be? I mean, could you just say the character went into Phoenix pose or something? And, or do or should you try to figure out how it all works? I'm just curious as to how do you guys feel about it? Oh, well, I mean, I think it, you have to know enough to make have it make sense for the reader. Um, I mean, that's that, that's with any sense of any element of world building. So if you're creating a, a, a fighting style from scratch, I would say conveying enough of the underlying concepts. Uh, I mean, I've done that before. It's like, and I've done a lot of martial arts, so I know you know Phoenix pose and Crane pose and Tiger and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, comes from the Shaolin Kung Fu or you know other things like that. You can. I mean, there are different ways you can convey. You can convey it either in the fight scene, you can have them trying to instruct somebody, you know, you can have them uh, thinking through it. There are different ways you can communicate that. But so long as the reader at least has a grasp of where this is coming from, what inspired it. Um, um, I know Adrian Chaibowski, I'm totally butchering his name, but he has this, uh, a fantasy series where all the human, human races are actually descended from insects. Uh, so you have praying mantis and dragonflies and beetles and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and you have these humanoid races that manifest aspects of insects. And their fighting styles are all of those things, but it's very iconic. You know what somebody who comes from a descendant of the dragonfly is going to be aerial versus uh, a praying mantis is going to be doing the, you know, that sort of thing versus an assassin beetle, you know, that, that sort of stuff. So. Um, Giving it enough of a thematic element, I think, is, is what's going to help you. Yeah, and his, yeah. his enter the, the the janitor thing. He's got the you know he's got the Mr. Clean. He's got the Billy Mays. He's got he's got broom <laughs> jutsu. Yeah, broom jutsu. You know, I think it can depend too on the character and on the world and how much time I guess you you know you put into it and how and like you said maybe maybe they do fight with a different, you know, a different style that you're making up. Um, you know, that's that's like a creative decision. Yeah, that you awesome. that you kind of have to decide how much time and effort you want to put into this to make your reader understand and how much room you have. In a short story, I don't know that I would necessarily throw a brand new phrase out. I mean that might be kind of hard to relay, you know, in, in a few word you know, in a few thousand words. Um, in a novel you could do that. Um, but also, it can get tiring for the reader to, to constantly try and figure out what they're doing. I mean, there's a reason why, I mean, I did it. There's a reason why, you, you know, you pick, you sort of pick an army and, and you, you just have them fight like an existing, like, you know, you pick some army that was pretty successful and you say, okay, my, my, my opposing army's gonna fight like them. And, and there's a reason for that because it's just something that's pretty simple and recognizable that it's just like a shortcut. And that could be really valuable, you know, just to move on with your story. But there's a ton of people who are super, super in to the, you know, the detail. I mean, I, there's a, a lot, I have a lot of details in my stuff that I like to dig into. And again, it's creative. You have to decide where, where do I want to put my effort? And at some point you kind of have to trust the reader's going to follow along with you. And it might or might not, you know, it's just, that's the risk we all play. Well, and I know get into the realm of reader taste. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Some people like to re some people like to read, like Dave said, uh, highly detailed, blow by blow fight scenes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they love to pick them apart and then email you when you did something wrong. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, that's um, fun too. That's yeah. awesome. Well, and and Betsy is fortunate. She's got some really good readers who read her stuff, who understand and appreciate the same type of things that she did. You know, she read that influenced her writing. So when she's creating these sequences, these fight sequences and so forth, you know, if she's going into details uh, with the fights, it's because, and, and her readers are going along with her, or her, her, her first readers are going along with her, um, it's because she's t trained them, she's taught them, she trusts them. Right. They're not going to take out something that she loves. Right. In, well, in and, the, and, and it's, there's a lot to be said for having people who know, um, for having people who, you know, that you can rely on to ask, to know. Um, I, I have, okay, I can't say I've never been in a fight. I think I had like an airplane fight with my cousin once. 
But I've never really been in a, you know, I've never been really been in a fight. So, yeah, and I've never, I mean, I don't think I've ever actually held Night's a young. sword. I don't think, I've actually, I have shot with a bow. But, you know, like, what, you have to think, well, what do I know? And then what do I need to go for? really find out and talk to people about? And there are resources out there, you know, if you just put calls out online. People love to talk about what they know, and they and fighting is one thing. If they're into it, man, that is something they will like tell you more than you need to know. So if you can find the right people to really advise you, um, you know, then you then you're you're bold. And that's what I do. I rely on. I have you know probably three to four people that I really rely on for that. The, you know, I say what what's what what is this? Is this is this even logistically possible? Is this you know? And go take a few classes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go, to, go to a boxing gym, go to a martial arts studio. A lot of them will give you several, a free class, a week of free classes, whatever. Just feel what it's like to be trying not to get kicked in the face, right. <laughs> you know, or, or lash out on instinct, or what yeah. it feels like to get you know, bruised and get the wind knocked out of you. you know, if you haven't experienced that, that right. sort of thing can really inform the details you put into a fight scene. Just so we're clear, we're not asking you to get your ass kicked. <laughs> yeah. 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 Not I like a partner. Least, However, yeah. it, so right. Right. look to your left, look to your right. right. <laughs> now attack one of those. Two. <laughs> <laughs> so. Right now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the, the I first, choose less resistance. <laughs> the first rule of fantasy fight panels. Do not talk about fantasy <laughs> fight panels. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's one, one of the things we haven't really talked about is like the nuts and bolts, like that was like, like, the, next, like the yeah. hard research um, yeah. um, about getting about make, giving your fight scenes like a visceral feel mm -hmm. uh, or a, something make it tactile, make it make it feel like the reader is in there, um, and 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 I think we've just touched on that now. Uh, like take a martial arts class, take a few punches, um, uh, kick somebody, <laughs> you know. Um, because uh, uh, that wants to be kicked, that wants to be kicked, yes, yeah. or at least doesn't mind. Right. Um, so, uh, so there's that. Uh, another, another, re uh, another resource that I recommend for people, uh, for writers, all writers who want to write fight scenes, uh, is a book called uh, On Combat. Um, and it's it's by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. Um, he, he he wrote another book called On Killing. Which was about the phys the psychological effects of killing a person. Uh, what happens for real to people, like to cops, to soldiers, to people who have to kill themselves in self defense, or to, to kill someone in self defense. Um, and but this book is about the physiological and psychological effects of of lethal combat, whether that's in hand to hand or with firearms. Um, and there, it, it's fascinating stuff about what our brains do. Like when bullet, like there are cops who can report seeing the bullets coming at them. Like their their perce their perception becomes so sharp that they can see the bullets coming, um, or that they'll notice that the guy across the street shooting the, at them has a gold watch on. Uh, like this sort of strange mis mishmash of of sensory input. Which, gosh, could be so fun for character it totally development. Is. Like, what is your character going to notice when, when you know, someone is coming at them? Right? I mean, what is the thing they're going to, what is the weird?